Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this event with the President of the World Bank Group, Mr. RJ Bunga. Let me recognise in our audience Stephen Lowy, the Deputy Chairman of the Institute, Board Members Glenn Stevens and Gillian Broadbent. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders. Ladies and gentlemen, in July 1944, even as Allied forces were liberating Europe from the Nazis, delegates from Allied countries met in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire. And their goal was to design the institutions of the post-war international economic order. And one of the institutions that emerged from these discussions was the World Bank. And since its establishment, the World Bank has done enormously important work towards eradicating global poverty, and in recent years has, has emphasised that this requires a livable planet. Eighty years later, the bank operates in more than 170 countries around the world and has funded over 12,000 development projects. Last year, RJ Bunga was appointed the 14th president of the World Bank Group. Mr. Bunga was born and educated in India and began his career in India working for Nestle, Pepsi and Citigroup. Three decades ago, he moved to the United States where his business career took flight. In recent years, he's served as president and chief executive of MasterCard, vice chairman of General Atlantic, chairman of Exor and chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce. In 2021, Vice President Kamala Harris asked RJ to serve as co-chair of the Partnership for Central America as well, and that is one relationship that may come in handy, RJ down the track. Since his appointment as President of the World Bank, he has travelled extensively. He's come to Australia from Fiji and Tuvalu, where he met with Pacific Islands Forum's leaders. We're very pleased to be hosting Mr Bunga at the Lowy Institute today. He will deliver some brief remarks from the lectern before I join him on stage for a conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. RJ Bunga. Thank you all. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you for having me. I, I will confess, every time I do one of these and I hear uh, you know, being introduced, I kind of think about the fact that the only thing that I would have been better introduced by my mother would have been my good looks. But that's just uh, <laughs> that's a separate topic altogether. So. Thank you again. Actually, to me, this marks the culmination of a journey that began now 15 months ago, when I first started at the World Bank, and I promised to visit every region where we operated. But three months before that, as the candidate, I went and met 93 different heads of state or finance ministers in an effort to understand what we needed to do better. But that is as the candidate. I met 100 civil society organizations, also as a candidate, after getting confirmed. I made this promise that I would get to all the regions and see it as from the eyes of being now at the bank. That journey has taken me across the globe, from Latin America to Africa to Asia to the Middle East, and now, just now, to the Pacific. But this tour was about much more than visiting countries. I was trying to listen. I was trying to learn. I'm trying to reimagine how the World Bank can serve a world which I think is quite changed from 80 years ago. It's the, whole, the fact is the institution is in profound need of change. Our mission was to write a new playbook for this group, for the World Bank group, one that is fit for today's challenges, but even more importantly, for the uncertainties of tomorrow. And I think our work has only just begun. Last week's visit to the Pacific Islands, the first of many, I'm sure I've just been signed up to make a commitment to come back around this time next year to the next Pacific Islands Forum uh, in the Solomon Islands. It's critical to that effort, these kind of trips. It is a region that is on the front lines of many of the crises that we are trying to address. A region that may seem remote to people who live far away, but the experiences and struggles and ambitions that are as close to home for all of us as it is for those in the islands. At the World Bank, we see these global challenges as intertwined. Uh, you'll hear me talk about this frequently. Climate change, inequality, fragility, these are all intertwined with the challenges of poverty. And I think the challenges of the Pacific Islands are a microcosm of forces that are playing out around the globe. Between my first trip to Peru, that's how it began in June, July last year, and on to this recent visit to Tuvalu, I have visited 27 countries on six continents, 
I've met with the leaders of developed and developing economies alike. I've spoken with civil society stakeholders, business leaders, experts in climate, development, finance. I've met everybody I possibly could. Most importantly, I've had the privilege to see firsthand how people are benefiting from the work of the World Bank. And each stop has reaffirmed a few truths. One, though aspirations of people around the world are universal, we live in a world of greater polarization and unfortunately, greater extremes. And while countries are facing a shared set of intertwined challenges, they experience them very differently. And although countries appreciate the work the World Bank has contributed to their development goals, they need more. And they require us to be faster, simpler, and more impact-oriented. So over the past year, we've tried to work on a set of reforms. Many of them were informed by the G20 expert group that was set up a couple of years before that. The idea is to make the World Bank better, bigger, more effective. Pulling from the fantastic people across the institution to deliver quality assistance in all its forms, knowledge, capacity building, policy dialogue, and of course, money. We're not just a money bank, we are a knowledge bank. So that's why you'll hear me think and start from that knowledge capacity. Targeting the World Bank's mission, our operational model, which is our speed and simplicity, and the financing capacity, obviously. I think we're advancing this at the fastest pace we can. If you think about what we've done so far, we've expanded our mission and our vision to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet, focusing on women and young people shortened our project approval process by three months. I want to shorten it by some more. Integrated operations as one World Bank in 20 pilot countries, trying to remove the bureaucracy and break down silos that we are all familiar with wherever we work, free up client capacity and approach challenges collectively. I found new ways to stretch our existing balance sheet further, leading to up to 120 billion of additional lending over the next decade. Overall, our knowledge bank structure, we've now put it into five verticals, people, prosperity, planet, infrastructure, and digital, each with clearly defined expertise in areas. We bring knowledge experts to the, front for, for the, the forefront of our country-driven models and our country partnership frameworks. That's kind of our strategic plan of the country. Create bankable projects, most importantly, help to implement them. A lot of these client governments do not have the capacity to implement these projects. That's one of our tasks. And I think that change of helping to provide capacity was welcomed by, among others, the Pacific leaders. I've taken a corporate scorecard. For those of you from the private sector here, we had 150 items on the corporate scorecard, which is just delightful. I've moved that to 22. And the idea is to drive the institution towards impact. And in doing so, give shareholders, clients, and most importantly, taxpayers, the ability to clearly see the impact that we are delivering. And as a direct result of these reforms, we think we're on a path to deliver scale and impact. How does this show up? More ambitious projects, seamlessly working across the institution, and the idea is to help these countries in their development journey. So some of you have probably seen some of these things we are trying to do, but we've committed to deploy 45% of World Bank group funds towards climate, with half of that headed for mitigation and half for adaptation by 2025. That's next year. In the Pacific region, 97% of our climate financing goes to adaptation, as it should. We set a target to provide quality, affordable health care, essentially through primary health care centers and some digital effort, to 1.5 billion people by 2030. Part of this work was in display in Fiji, where the World Bank is expanding access through medical facilities and telehealth and community health workers. We're executing an action plan to bring clean, stable, and affordable energy to 300 million Africans by 2030. 600 million are not connected at all to power in the continent. 250 million of those will come from the work we are doing, 50 million in partnership with the African Development Bank. We're expanding social protection programs with partners, something I know from my prior life, to alleviate hunger for half a billion people by 2030. Half a billion, aiming for half of these beneficiaries to be women. I think we're excited about what we can deliver with these changes in place, but I will tell you I'm very clear-eyed about the scale of the challenges ahead of us. And that's why we're working to secure a very significant replenishment of the International Development Association, IDA, 
which as the Lowy Institute stated very plainly in a paper last week and some more today, is critical for the development and stability of, among other places, the Pacific Islands. Many shareholders like Australia are making hard budget decisions and trade-offs over the next few months. Everybody's got fiscal challenges. But during this time, all I hope is they will keep in mind that the magic of IDA is not only the lifeline it offers to these countries. It's not just the impact it delivers, but it's the unique capacity of this institution to multiply every dollar four times through our AAA rating and the bond markets. It is the best deal in development. It doesn't mean you should bring bilateral aid down to zero. That would be an error to be assumed. But if, for example, Australia is using $10 and you put six into bilateral and you give me four, the four becomes 16, the total is 22. This is just math. And it needs to be kept in mind when those priorities are being put together. We note that the World Bank alone cannot be enough to provide the trillions that are estimated to be required annually for climate and fragility and education and hunger and healthcare and all the intertwined challenges we're talking about. Or, most importantly, produce jobs enough to absorb the 1.2 billion young people in emerging markets that will become working age adults over this coming decade. Currently, the same markets are on a pathway to generate 400 plus million jobs in those very same countries. Now, you know, forecasts are not destiny, things can change. But 800 million people without a clear path to a job with the dignity it gives, because poverty is also a state of mind, that is scary. And I think we need all shoulders of the wheel governments, philanthropies, and multilateral banks working together. To close that financing and jobs gap, we clearly need the private sector. We need their ingenuity, we need their speed. We are not going to be as fast as they are. We need their resources and their sustainable resources to create the demand for investment by generating bankable projects. That's why, you know, we've got 15 leading CEOs led by Mark Tucker and Shriti Badera, including Macquarie and HSBC and Mitsubishi and Tata and Tamasek. We're working together to figure out what we can do with renewable energy in emerging markets and have already begun implementing their inputs to us and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. We've also launched a dedicated initiative aimed at generating jobs led by President Tharman of Singapore and former President Michelle Bachelet of Chile. They will lead a group of business leaders, civil society and academics. And the idea is to meet for the first time now in our annual meetings in October and help us to design the strategy to create jobs for young people focusing on energy, infrastructure, agriculture as a business, healthcare, and probably tourism. But for us, this is just the beginning. Ultimately, the World Bank is an instrument that reflects the ambition of those on whose generosity it relies. And the progress we're all discussing is going to demand more from all of us. So and thank you for listening to me. I would like to elicit your support as we go along, but Thank you again and give me a chance to be here with you. Thanks a lot. Yep. Yes. RJ, thanks for your remarks and my apologies for neglecting to refer to your good looks in my, <laughs> in my introduction. Yeah. Uh, you thank you. become my mother. <laughs> Um, thank you for sitting down for a conversation with me. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, after RJ and I have spoken for 20 or 30 minutes, um, he's agreed to take some questions from the audience. So please put your thinking caps on uh, and get ready to, to catch my eye and I'll, I'll come to you presently. RJ, let me start by asking a few questions about you. You were born and educated in India, as I mentioned. You started your executive career there, but the second half of your life has been in the United States and you're a naturalized US citizen. Um, how has being an Indian and being an American, how have those two identities shaped your worldview? I mean, so, you know, Prime Minister Modi talks about make in India as a big strategy. I am truly made in India. I kind of grew up there, educated there, worked there for the first 15 years of my life, and then uh, moved overseas in those days with Citibank and then stayed with them for a while, and then to MasterCard, and you described the rest of it. The, uh, the thing about India is that I grew up taking a lot of things for granted. And one of those was diversity. You, if you grew up in an army house or army family in India, you get transferred every couple of years. I did not understand that it was 
a challenge to think about attending each other's religious festivals, or that we kind of hung around together and never thought twice about it. That was just passe. It is what I did. And I realized when I came overseas how much more attention had to be paid to the topic to actually systematically make a difference, to lift those who did not have the same opportunity that I was lucky enough to get. I think that, as a young man, I don't think I completely comprehended that the way I did when I moved out overseas. But the other thing about India that you get very clearly is the fact that infrastructure and the challenges of that infrastructure are something you live with. And you learn how to cope with it. And I used to call it plan B and plan C. You had to have a plan B and a plan C for everything because plan A was certainly not going to work because something was not going to happen. And so the ability to deal with ambiguity is a skill set that most of us who've grown up and worked in India for a while cannot take for granted again. And I think that's helpful in my current role in many ways. The thing about India that I, people, when I, when I got sent here as a candidate for this job, that everyone took for granted is that I would therefore understand the emerging markets in a way that others may not. And I, I hope that's right, but I don't think anybody has a monopoly on understanding others if you pay enough attention and you care and you're open-minded about it. So I, I hope that's right, but I don't take that to the bank, if you know what I mean. Living in the US, taught me many other things. It taught me the importance of scale. Because the US's biggest advantage is the scale that it gives and delivers, which allows a lower cost of many things, a better delivery. Many, the advantages that come with scale are second to none. One of the things I'm trying to do in the bank is to avoid the tyranny of small things, but to try and focus on a fewer, more impactful things. So in shorter time periods, we can show that we can move the needle and use that to get the credibility to make the next change happen, as compared to spreading the peanut butter too thin to borrow an American set, which doesn't match with what I just said. Never mind. Don't let the facts get in the way of the story, right? Uh, that would be kind of where I'm coming from on who I am. I, uh, to be completely honest, I've never looked at myself as being either this or that. Home is kind of where I am. And I've moved many times, and I just make home where I live. And I presume that to be natural, and it allows me to, to deal with many changes in our lives. Okay, well, home is where you live, and you live at the World Bank now. Unfortunately, true. Um, <laughs> what, what, why did you decide to put yourself forward as a candidate? You were I the... didn't put myself forward. <laughs> Somebody stepped back clearly, and I got left standing in the queue. <laughs> um, I have no clue how my name ended up in this role. I actually don't. I just know that I got these calls back a year and a half, two years ago. And at the beginning, I kind of said, you have to be crazy. I'm not doing this. And then I, was, I got a particular call that left me very little choice. And that when you get that call, you kind of say yes. And when I got that, I did. And so I'm here. And now that I'm here, I will give it my best. It's a five-year term, and I'm very committed to it. And I'm very committed to working with the amazing people the bank has. It has got outstanding people. The question is, how do we get this whole thing to work in a way that is fit for purpose for this future? And but I what, actually don't know how I ended up in this. OK. Do you want to tell us anything about that single call, by no, the way? No, there's nothing. nothing. There's nothing new in that. You've probably read about it already. OK. So, um, so tell us about the challenges of, and, and, and the opportunities of working in an international institution in the public sector after living, making your life in the private sector. A lot of stuff is actually more in common than there is separate. You know, the challenge of silos you heard me mention just now, this is not unique to the public sector. The companies I've worked in at Citibank or Nestle or MasterCard, and I apologize in advance for all of you who feel I shouldn't mention your company in any way. But come on, I mean, every CEO sitting here, silos are what we are born to deal with. It is a challenge every day. That part is pretty common. The, I'll tell you what is very different, just for, since that is an important thing. The natural tools that you use for managing to collect people to go into one direction in the private sector are different from the natural tools you use in an organization like the bank. You don't have the ability 
to change compensation in substantial enough ways to direct people's behavior in a certain direction. You also don't typically hire, demote, or fire with the same capability or methodology in an institution of this type that you may be able to do in the private sector. Those tools of both motivation, the carrot and the stick, are very different. But on the other hand, I lived my life in the private sector not trying to use hiring and firing, but trying to use setting a vision and a mission and trying to simplify how you talk about it so that everybody can find their pathway and their role in that vision. And then in their combined power of these people, get the energy of the organization to move. That's no different at the World Bank. You have to communicate your vision and mission with simplicity, be willing to repeat it a hundred times and not get tired, create simple metrics for success, that corporate scorecard, allow people to celebrate that success, but also feel that if they take a risk, it's okay. These are all things that are common in the private sector and in this kind of an institution. There's more in common than people would think. There, is, there was another president of the World Bank who was born outside of the United States, moved to the US, became a naturalized citizen, was successful in banking before he, he joined the World Bank, and that's Jim Wolfenson, who was a Sydney sider and a friend of our chairman, Frank Lowy. Um, did you look at Jim's record at the World Bank or the record of your other predecessors in those first months to really try to tease out what, what you could learn? I mean, how could you not, right? There's so many illustrious people from... I think McNamara was another amazing individual in the bank. I think Jim, Jim I got to know well because, as you remember, after the World Bank, he joined Citibank mm. and was actually a great colleague and friend to me, particularly when I was running Asia and life used to get a little hairy in the financial crisis. Jim had a way of making you feel calm through the way he spoke to you. And um, you have to study what they do. The problem really I found is that the circumstances of the bank have changed quite dramatically in the past 15, 20 years. Whether it's the approach to multilateralism or the challenges of the world and their intertwined nature. I'm sure every generation and every president thinks that they had the biggest problems to deal with. That I'm, I do not doubt, but I do feel that things have changed quite a bit. And if you go back to the fact that this institution was created to help implement effectively the Marshall Plan, at a point of time, and that the first bullet trains in Japan were financed by this institution. Mm -hmm. That's a slightly different circumstance from today. And I think that's why it needs a fresh look and feel. But history always teaches you what you could do or could not do. That's important. Well, let's go to one of, I mean, you mentioned in your remarks your ambitious reform agenda, some of the things you're trying to to, yeah. in some of the ways you're trying to remake the bank. And of course, climate is at the center of it. As I mentioned, um, you've expanded the mission of the, the bank. You've reminded us that, that um, in order to create a world free of poverty, we need a livable planet. You've set targets for the amount of um, financial assistance at the bank, the proportion of, of World Bank funds that will go to climate projects. Tell us about that as, as a challenge. Tell us how you're progressing on the climate front. And the bank was working pretty hard on climate even before I turned up. And that's a story that doesn't get told. So there was already a 30% target out there in the bank to get to. And when I joined, I found that we were, well, we were going to go past the 30 anyway. So the question really was, what should our ambition be? And the 45 was not a scientific number. It was kind of pulled just to make an adequate difference from 30 to set the fact that we needed to change the paradigm that we were looking at this from. It's the same way that to say that half would go to adaptation and half to mitigation, there's no scientific basis for that. It is my attempt to remind the emerging markets that I'm not doing this only to change the energy emissions heavy pattern of growth that all of us have enjoyed and that thou shalt not have it. That is not what I was trying to do. I was trying to make them feel that we have to do that because that's critical, but we also have to help you manage the downstream impact of what has happened in the past 40 years of growth in the rest of the world. And so trying to get the credibility of balance is what I'm trying to do with these statements. The, uh, we'll go past the 45. We're already at 44 by next year. By now, we probably cross 45. That's not the issue. Getting to the half for adaptation versus the half for mitigation may be challenging for at least a year or two more because you have to build back a pipeline of adaptation projects. 
And it's not a coincidence that the countries where adaptation is most required are also those where the capacity to implement those projects is the weakest. And therefore, this is not something that you can turn the tap on and off with. You have to build it systematically through partnerships and capacity building and diversion of resources. And, and that's the work that's hard work to do. Climate financing is not just about you know, renewable energy versus coal or oil or gas and so on and the transition. It's also very clearly about everything ranging from, you know, in Africa, if you look at schools that are being built, if you put a tin roof with a red tin, which you will see all the time, you paint that white, there's an eight degree difference in the room underneath in the heat of summer. That is not expensive. It's not rocket science. It doesn't need new technology. It just needs you to get the darn roof painted white. It's possible. And so a lot of what needs to be done is blocking and tackling with things we already know to be able to make a difference, whether it is methane. So, you know, if you grow rice the way we did in India when I grew up, which is you flood the field when you plant the rice and then you let it stay flooded till you harvest it, there's one kind of methane emissions from that rice. The reality is you need to plant the rice in a flooded field, but you can then drain it, irrigate it periodically, and then reflood it for harvesting. If you do that, the amount of methane emissions is between 40 and 60% lower. And rice is a very large emitter of methane in the world. Methane is 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide, but nobody seems to talk about it. And so we've got to start doing things that we can get done and start working on them in a way that is tangible and measurable. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do with climate financing, not just you know, the next big technology that will solve for batteries that could solve for the future of mankind. I would love to do that. But there's a lot of things that can be done before that, which can turn the tide and help to turn the way in which uh, climate and its management has been handled for a long time. All your work on development and climate financing takes place in the context of the global economy, of course. Uh, when you look at the world economy, what are the trends that worry you most? Is it protectionism, industrial policy, automation, AI? What are the, what are the elements that, that trouble you in terms of achieving your bank's mission? How about all of the above? But, but the, um, let me pick on AI for a minute. Most people are discussing AI either from the lens of the enormous benefits it provides, of which no doubt we will see enormous advantages from the delivery of healthcare to all other kinds of topics, which could be really useful. Some of them do discuss the challenges in jobs. I would give you a slightly different lens. To get AI done well, there are four things you need. You need computing power. You need a thing called electricity. Lots of it. You need data kept in its simplest form, because otherwise you can't make sense out of it. And you need people who know how to manipulate that data and allow algorithms to be applied to it. I would tell you that the emerging markets, by and large, has neither computing power, nor electricity, nor data kept in its simplest, safest form, nor the people to manipulate it. I think we should think about whether AI is going to make the fight of inequality easier or tougher in the coming years. And that, to me, is a different lens from the traditional lens of looking at AI, which I value and I'm greatly excited about, but I'm also worried about this side of it. Mm. So all the topics you mentioned have challenges depending on how you, which lens, which prism you approach them with, and therefore there are opportunities here and challenges here. And the task is not to hold them back because of the challenges, but to navigate your way through them in a way that is fair and equitable. And that's the way I'm trying to approach it. I would say that, that economically, I worry about protectionism only because I think the last 30 years of growth has, has relied on open markets and just-in-time manufacturing. And I think that model is going through enormous change as we speak. That doesn't mean that another model will not evolve, which could be quite useful. It may have a different form of trade, a different set of rules. I don't know that. But what you don't know can always be frightening. And I think that's one of the reasons why this change in the economy is a change we have to navigate carefully. Again, an opportunity and a challenge. 
an opportunity for nearshoring, an opportunity for friendshoring, an opportunity for 3D manufacturing. I mean, there's many opportunities in this, but of course there are the challenges of the manner of growth that we have got used to. So these are all interesting issues around the bank. The bank's main issue at the end of the day comes down to these jobs for young people. If we do not find a way to create productive opportunities for these 1.2 billion young people coming through the pipe in the coming 10, 12 years in the emerging markets. We talk about this as the demographic dividend of these countries. And yes, it is a dividend if when these people are growing up, they get clean air, clean water, healthcare, and education. And once they're grown up, they get a chance to get a job. Currently, that's not the pathway. And I think that's something we have to be thinking about very carefully in this coming period. Because I believe that if you're concerned about migration right now, think about a multiplier factor on that. If you're concerned about coups in unstable countries, think about what causes them and what could be a challenge in the future. On the other hand, the optimism and energy and productive capability of those young people, women and men, could be a transformative for our future and for our children's future. What about the impact of conflict on development? I know you met with Vladimir Zelensky recently, and I saw that I saw a comment from you that the war in Ukraine is not only destroying lives and cities in Ukraine, it is causing pain for people in faraway towns and on distant farms. This is, this is something that's sometimes missed in a country like Australia. How much damage has Russia's brutal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine done to the cause of eradicating poverty around the world? I mean, uh, the, you know, the gains made on fighting poverty over the prior 30, 40 years, a lot of it happened through the creation of jobs in some of these emerging markets. If you look at the lifting of people out of poverty in China and India and others, it was the creation of jobs. And COVID made that hit a wall for various reasons and woke us up to the fact that this is not an inexorable line going up. There would be things happening to it. The war has just added on to it from the availability and cost of food and fertilizer to the challenges of the price of oil to all kinds of issues that impact countries in ways that they're not built to absorb. That's what I was referring to in this. I, there's a, it's not the only war. I would tell you that one of the things that the emerging markets feel somewhat left out on is that they feel that when Ukraine happened, the Western world showed up with the truckloads of money and the ability to try and turn that tide. But they've had their wars in Africa and other places for a long time, and they quite haven't seen the same response. Mm -hmm. Now, that's fine. That's the way it is right now. But that's the mistrust, one of the factors. There are others too. There is the issue of, of how do you get to affordable, accessible energy. If you go by the fact that thou shalt not have gas, and you should only go to renewable energy. You know, first of all, technically the issue is, what do you do about base loads? Secondly, there's the issue of, uh, you know, we in the Western world have kind of used gas quite a bit. We currently use it, just to be clear. And in Europe, it is the single largest source of electricity supply. And just to be clear, America is the largest exporter of natural gas in the world. And just, I could keep going. And so when you do that, but then you tell the other guy that, hey, listen, buddy, you're going to go solar and wind because we don't think we can afford to do that again. It is true, we cannot. But the answer is not to just say, therefore, that's the only option you're going to get. When they have natural gas in their soil. So I think finding ways to do the right thing but thread the needle in a way that creates trust is a really important part of what we all have to do in the coming decade or two. Because otherwise, this mistrust is drifting us apart rather than bringing us together. That's the issue. All right, let me ask you a couple of questions about our part of the world and then come to the audience. Um, let me ask you about China uh, and, and Asia. At the Institute, one of the things we do that I'm sure you know of is we track aid to Southeast Asia and also to the Pacific. And we have amazing maps that, that illustrate the the flows of development assistance. And China is the, the most important development partner in Southeast Asia, the second most important in the Pacific. Um, China has been criticized for lending too much for dubious projects 
including to countries that are experiencing debt problems and then being reluctant to provide debt relief um, when required. Tell us a bit about China's responsibilities as a significant lender. So I mean, what's really changed between the prior debt crisis and now is the emergence of bilateral lenders as a large and commercial lenders as a much larger proportion of the total debt in countries. And China is the one we all talk about, but to be honest, there's a, if you look at the whole mix, it's a completely different mix from the HIPAA days of the, you know, 30 years ago. So we are part of something called the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, IMF and World Bank. And we try and work with all the countries, bilaterals, multilaterals, and others, and the Paris Club, as it was called, in an effort to find ways to help some of these countries. Some of the ways we help is just tangible. Since Zambia, Ethiopia, Chad, and Ghana joined the G20 Common Debt Framework for Relief, we're the only institution that gives them money. We've given them $16 billion, of which eight is pure grant. No repayment, no interest. Nine out of the 16 is net positive. So we're their lifeline. That's through IDA, which is why replenishing IDA is important in other ways as well. Uh, but a lot of these institutions, while it, these countries, while it took time to work their way through the debt framework, we're making progress and each one is a little faster than earlier and China is beginning to play its role in recognizing what it has to do to get that debt burden back to the right level. Why did we get here? We got here because an era of low interest rates allowed much to happen, which probably should not happen if you'd looked out 10 to 15 years and looked at debt burdens in an appropriate way. But to be completely clear, it's not just about a developing country. I would argue that the financial crisis of 07, 08, 09, with what happened with CDOs and mortgages in the US, consisted of people taking mortgages they never should have taken. Negative amortization, interest-only arms. How many people in this audience know what the heck that is, other than these few here? <laughs> they were the way mortgages were being done in the United States. Why would that be a smart thing to do for anybody? Negative amortization, interest-only, adjustable rate mortgages. If you could choose enough terms to tell you, please don't do that, that was the list. So, there's, you know, hindsight's 20-20. I'm very focused on working with these countries to get to the next phase. What I've, what I've discussed with the Chinese government with complete clarity is that I understand all the issues around debt and national security. But at the end of the day, there are three things that everybody needs to come together to work on. Climate change, the challenges of healthcare, particularly for aging populations, and the challenges of creating a model of development where everybody doesn't feel the need to migrate to an urban area, because the urban areas are collapsing under that migration. All three are common. All three have no national security implications. All three have a common humanity at its core. We should work together on these. All right, tell us about your visit to the Pacific. You were, um, it's been a long time since a World Bank president has been to a country like Australia, to Fiji, the first time I think, I think your visit to Tuvalu was the first time a president has been there. Why was it so important for you to go to the region? What did you learn? What were the big things you took away? Learn, I mean, you know, the obvious stuff about the challenges of climate are very visible when you come to a Tuvalu, but I didn't need to go there to see that, that's obvious. I think more important was to meet the people, both the government and young people, and try and understand from their eyes how they see the next couple of decades. In Fiji, it was not just to see Fiji and its opportunities and its challenges. We have just done a, a health report in Fiji, which is creating a baseline to have a discussion with the government to persuade them to think about non-communicable diseases, what I call the diseases of affluence, heart trouble, diabetes, blood pressure, has reached a point in Fiji where the, the average age that you expect to get to in Fiji is now 68 years, and it's not going in the right direction. And I think that's work that needs to change and be done through early diagnosis, through primary health centers and the like, that's topics of that type that we're discussing with them. But I also got to meet the Pacific Island Forum, which meant I got a chance to meet 10, 12 of them at one go and really see what their challenges are, one of which is correspondent banking which again, these guys are familiar with. And uh, the bank is putting together a package to help go through 
the initial challenge of subsidizing the uneconomic nature of doing correspondent banking in these countries. But the real issue is, how do you get past this for the future? Because there is a subscale issue, and there's an issue of meet, make sure standards are met. And I think doing that the right way through creating some kind of a central utility which is owned by the countries and maybe people like us and others needs to be worked out so we can find a good, scalable, long-term, safe solution to keep the Pacific Islands in the financial mainstream. That kind of stuff would not happen easily without physically kicking the tires and meeting people on the ground and talking to them. Similarly, uh, one of my biggest uh, topics that I was trying to push is that while it's important to invest in resilient infrastructure, and we're doing this with ports and, and shoring up seawalls and the like in these islands to help get guarantee of life, to sort of quality of life for a period, Tuvalu faces an existential threat, which is an estimate of eventually going under some years from now. And the Australian government has signed this treaty with them about both the 280 people a year who could come here and go back and forth with, with full status, but also recognizing their economic area, even if the island disappears. And I think the issue really is, therefore, what do you do between now and what looks like an inevitable time to ensure quality of life, where it's no regrets investments in the resiliency, but what does resiliency really constitute? Is it only infrastructure or is it the people? And what do you do about their education and skilling? And what do you do about their health care so they can be productive during this period or productive as migrants to other countries? I think those topics were important to do personally. And I found it very useful to be there and build that connection. Good. All right, who wants to ask a question of the World Bank President? If you'd like to, I can see Roland Raja. I can see a number of hands. So we'll start with Roland, who is the head of the Indo-Pacific Development Center here at the Institute. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank you for those uh, very interesting uh, remarks. Um, my, my question is uh, whether you think big emerging economies like India and Indonesia, should they get a bigger say in the governance uh, of the World Bank, given their rising economic weight and given their centrality to the global net zero uh, transition? Yeah. And if you think so, um, is this something you intend to push during uh, your tenure? Yeah. Look, I think that these institutions were created with a certain weight of proportion of, of being voting rights and the like, at a time when a number of the countries didn't exist, let alone change their current scale and scope of who they are in the economy. But traditionally, your voting rights have got determined by your contribution of capital to the institution. So the question really is, is giving voting rights without capital contribution, already some have been given, just to be clear, uh, the emerging markets have a slug of voting rights in our institution already, even though they would not have contributed money. And the countries that have given up the most of their share, actually country number one is the United States, which has given up the most of its share, even though its contribution of capital is well beyond its voting rights. So people have done that already. The question you're asking is, what's the next click in that? And to me, the next click in that has to, has to keep evolving in that direction. There will be an opportunity when the IBRD uh, next year in 2025 has to do a shareholding review of the institution. And that's the time we're going to have a chance to discuss this and then see where it takes us. All right. Other hands? Yes. Lady on the end. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, my question is, what measures does the World Bank recommend to ensure the developed country's investment in the Pacific promotes sustainability, uh, particularly for develop developments without compromising on um, national sovereignty or fiscal health? Look, I, we have a scorecard, we have objectives, we have ways of measuring what we're doing. Included in that scorecard is everything to do with sustainability while also aiming for development, whether it is poverty alleviation or women's rights or gender or education or healthcare. So that's kind of inbuilt in what we do. And nothing's going to change, whether that's in the Pacific Islands or in Africa. We have to do that in all these places. That's who we are. We don't always get it right. Development all doesn't always get it right. And my objective is not to say I will get it right 100%, but I will be open to measuring mistakes and fixing them if things don't work out. That's what I'm trying to do. I saw this gentleman in the second row and then shell lines uh, towards the back. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, President, for those remarks. Uh, Scott Atkins. RJ, RJ. RJ, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Scott Atkins, Chair of Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, the work that the World Bank has done in East Asia and the Pacific around digital transformation is very impressive. And I just wonder, leaving aside the AI challenges that you spoke of, is there more that digital transformation can do to supercharge the World Bank's work in a similar sense as your multiplier formula gave us earlier today as well? I think digitization is an unbelievable asset in breaking through the challenges of development. If you step back for a second, and I've talked about this publicly in my prior life as well, I believe the world's challenges are on three sides of a triangle. One side of the triangle is the issue of one versus many, what we now call inequality. And what I really mean is it's my growth, even if it's at your cost. That seems to have got embedded in a lot of places. The second side of the triangle is the challenge of humanity versus nature, which we're all now talking about as climate change and water and forestry and soil quality and degradation and all that. And the reason these two sides of the triangle don't fall down under their own weight is because the third side, unfortunately, keeps them stable. That's the worst of it, which is the trade-off between long-term and short-term. And all of us are incented, whether you're the CEO of an institution or the mayor of a city or a politician in a different phase, or teachers, this system incents you towards short-termism. And finding a way to thread the needle from that push and pull of short-termism versus long-term thinking is kind of what I think places like the bank can be good at. The, one that, the thing that allows you to break through these log jam of the triangle is technology. Whether it is new technology being developed or whether it is digitization, which enables the power of incumbency to be tackled in a way that you could not have done otherwise. So I'm very firmly embracing it. That's why I've created a special vertical in the Knowledge Bank only on digital. It's not that digital doesn't impact healthcare and education of people or their prosperity or the planet or infrastructure. But I think if we don't focus on it with digital public goods being set up the right way so you can create the level foundation for private sector to then build its capabilities on it, then I think we've left an opportunity on the table. And I've just hired a gentleman who helped build out South Korea's governance of digital and build its basic platform as a country, and then went to work in the private sector. He's now joined us as the head of that. I think you should see us wanting to play a very active role, on both on digital public infrastructure, but also data and the use of AI and its ethics and governance over the coming years. Thank you, Shell. For those remarks, President Benga, I'm Shell Lyons, a research fellow at the Lowy Institute who works on climate change. Um, over the past decade, we've seen two multilateral development banks uh, capitalised, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank. Could you speak to the World Bank experience of working with those banks and whether you see their establishment as a positive or negative addition to the public financing landscape? Yeah. Look, first of all, I think our challenges are too many for me to believe that you shouldn't have more shoulders to the wheel. So... I don't think that having more development banks right now is a particular problem. I think the problem is only if the resources get dissipated into so many places that we all become subscale. That would be a bad thing. Right? But, but the reality is, to get development going, we're going to have to find a way to incorporate the private sector into this. That'll be a multiplier beyond all the resources of the development banks put together. So I'm kind of less hassled about multiple banks. If anything, I think We've all got strengths we can play off on each other. I have a very good partnership with all of those. I, from the day I came, I've been signing deals with them to work together. With the Asian Development Bank, I think we have the biggest opportunity to do things dramatically differently, uh, including share procurement standards and due diligence standards so that a country with limited capacity at the other end, where we are both financiers of a project, doesn't have to do things twice. In the same way, we've recently launched, the World Bank has launched a digital platform for co-financing. So in the old days, if I found a project, old days, two years ago, found a project, <laughs> we would have to go to the other multilateral banks and say, would you join us in this endeavor? And here, we're putting a billion, would you put in 200 million, 300 million, and create a coalition of the willing to get there. That's kind of inefficient. If you can create a digital platform where all projects found by any bank are put in, and we can all bid on it simultaneously, you create transparency and less duplication and less of a competitive mindset where competition is not our friend. And so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to work on 
with all of these institutions in this coming period of time. I also saw Mel's, Mel Pill's hand there. Uh, hello, um, Melanie Poole. Um, I'm also a research fellow at the Indo-Pacific Development Centre for Climate Change. Um, you talked a lot about the importance of adaptation in the Pacific, um, even migration and, and sovereignty. Um, so how do you envisage to convince the private sector to invest in these kinds of issues, considering that these projects would be um, basically non-bankable? Yeah. So to me, I've got this private sector group focused on renewable energy, not on adaptation. I can't expect the private sector to put money into something where their shareholders won't get the return that they could otherwise take that money and put it into a different bucket. That's just ground reality. So I'm not trying to change ground reality. I'm trying to say, let's take renewable energy, where today solar and wind are shown to be per unit of output cheaper than fossil fuel. If that be the case, why is it that private investors are not beating the doors down of every middle-income country? Forget about smaller, lower-income countries, but middle-income countries where there is scale and size opportunity. Why are they not breaking the doors down of that country to put billions at work to change the mix of energy output in that country? And what it comes down to is five things. And the first one is lack of clarity or predictability on regulatory policy. And I think... Sort of, you can keep saying, but you know, why doesn't the private sector do it? Hey, they've got two places to put their money. With now, with the things like the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. and other industrial policy in the developed world, where you have predictability and, and consistency, why would you not choose to put money there as compared to somewhere else where you're not sure what they would do two years from today? And so, having that clarity, and I give the example of India often on this, when Modi became prime minister. He made this statement very early that India is going to get to 30% of its mix by solar by 2030. One of those comments. But then he went at it and met the private sector and said, tell me what you need from me, both domestic and international, to get you to the 30%. And they gave him a list of 10 things like all of us did in my prior life when I went and met a government. The reality is you don't expect to get all 10. If you got three or four, you would put your money to work. But you need them to be listening to you and paying attention and understanding your challenge. He did that. He gave them a few. Today, installed capacity in India, 42% is solar. But here's the problem. Generating capacity is not 42 because they haven't yet connected the grid properly and done the balancing of the grid you need to do to manage through the ups and downs of the variability of solar energy production. But they're, only, they're still six years away from 2030. I would not be surprised if India made an announcement over the next three, four years of taking one big metropolis and converting it completely to renewable energy, because that's the kind of capacity they are building today. It's possible if you get some clarity on regulatory policy. Second big one that comes across is in political risk insurance despite that. That we can help with. We do risk insurance across different parts of the institution inside a thing called MEGA and IFC, all our acronyms, we do stuff in that. I've put them together, so the back office is now one, making a simplified list of the guarantees we can do with simplified pricing, so you can do one due diligence across the institution for the insurance you might need. We've already more than, I think we're close, getting close to a 50-60% growth of our insurance business. My ambition is to take MEGA, which is the institution that provides insurance, and convert it from a secret weapon, where the bad word is secret, to a willing weapon where the good word is willing. And that's where we're going with that one. The third one has to do with foreign exchange. And, you know, I used to be a banker who lost his way. And one thing I learned long back was that anybody who believes that they know how to fix foreign exchange, you should probably run in the opposite direction from that individual. Because the unpredictability of forex markets are what they are. And if you expect someone to expect in dollars, euros, and yen, in a 30-year investment and get paid back in local currency, even in a good middle-income market like Indonesia or India, that unhedged exposure of 30 years could cripple the idea of the spreadsheet that enables the investor to put the money to work. But there is no hedge that Westpac will sell me for 30 years on the Indonesian rupiah. If they do, he won't be at Westpac longer. <laughs> so the issue is, I've known him, so don't. <laughs> The issue really is how do you find a solution to that? We're working our way through a couple of ideas there. 
One is to do risk sharing, multi-layered risk sharing with the country. And so there are a few thoughts there that I'm working my way through. I don't know that I have an answer to that one. And the other one, which I think is very attractive, is the idea of creating an originate to distribute model in this category. So if you went to Larry Fink at BlackRock and you said, hey, Larry, wouldn't you like exposure to drinking water or water projects in Africa? He would say yes. But if I went to him with 27 projects at sizes ranging from 20 million to 120 with bespoke governance and pricing in each, and I asked him to underwrite those to, to effectively create a securitizable pool, I think he would shoot himself. <laughs> and so, because it doesn't make any sense. It's not economically viable for him to do it. So we're now working with a bunch of market-making banks and with BlackRock and with Standard & Poor's to try and find a way to create a originate to distribute packageable securities model for this kinds of projects so that the real money sitting in <coughs> pension funds and the like can come to work on this space. That's gonna be a four or five year effort, not a one or two. But that to me is the big prize in this space. RJ, I'm gonna squeeze in one final question if I can on cricket. I know you're a, you're a cricket fan, Mr. Modi's a cricket fan. Jay Shankar, the Indian external affairs minister, is a cricket yes. fan. And Jay Shankar and I have joked over the years about writing a book together on the similarities between cricket and international policy. Because like foreign policy, cricket is a long game. Cricket is opaque. Sometimes a draw can be a win. Sometimes the, 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 the qualities that a cricketer requires, discipline, intelligence, resilience are, are what's required in international policy. So I wonder, I, I want a chapter from you for our book. Um, when, you, when, when you think about Just cricket- to be clear, the chapter I would write would start by reminding you that it was an Aussie who changed that thing and converted it to one day cricket. And now we're down to, you know, literally 20 ball cricket if we could too. So <laughs> this long game has got a little lost in cricket, but never mind, never mind. Never uh, mind, don't get the facts in the way of the story. All right, all right, fine. So tell us, is, oh. there, is there something you've learned from cricket that you can apply to your career? <laughs> Little guy called Kerry Packer, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Cricket, I mean, cr cricket, cricket in your career, is there, is there something you've learned? I broke two fingers playing cricket when I was young. Yeah. They're still deformed. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I've learned is deformity doesn't go away. Uh, the pain doesn't go away, but you certainly learn how to do it better next time because I didn't break any others. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. I will tell you that, that, and this is, it's a serious comment to a, to a frivolous uh, point, is that development is the long game. That's the long-term, short-term thing I was talking about. But development requires the willingness to take a few hard knocks. You're going to have to. Because there are no simple solutions in development. And when, when people try and draw black and white lines on every issue in development, as in everything else in life, the answer is in the grays. And finding a way to get that done, where you move the needle forward, where you move the scoreboard forward and keep the singles coming on the board while you're waiting for hitting the fours and the sixes that'll move your score forward, you really have to keep that going. Ladies and gentlemen, RJ mentioned this is his 20th visit or so to Sydney, and I think you get a sense from his informality and his sense of humour and his quick-wittedness and his cricket knowledge, which he demonstrated <laughs> at the end, why he's so popular with Australians. But I think you've also got a sense today from his energy and his intelligence and his ambition as to why, he's a, why he was such a fabulous... Um, appointee to the World Bank, even if he was a reluctant candidate. <laughs> we want to thank you for your time and wish you wish you all the best in your important work. Please thank RJ Banga. Thank you. Thank you, sir.